uh, the tent, if you saw the tent out there, I stayed here Friday night, and we have a, a shepherd's uh, prayer um, at Saturday morning, and even though I was right there at the tent, slept there, I was ready at like 6.30, I still got late, I was late to the <laughs> shepherd's prayer by about 10 or 15 minutes, so <laughs> anyway, um, welcome to Christ Fellowship, um, man, what a what a great day we had yesterday at the picnic. Uh, you read about uh, love feasts, about real communion, and yesterday that was real communion. Speaking of that, we have uh, communion cups. Um, back in the corner there, if you haven't picked that one of those up yet, um, walk back there now and grab that. Um, there are communication cards there too and, uh, before you come in to those doors, but we'll talk about that later. We um, wanted to let you know that Rachel is ill, and uh, they did take her to the hospital to see what was going on. Uh, we don't really have an update at this point. She's fine, but she, we, we don't know if it's appendicitis or, or what at this point. But anyway, let's say a, a, a prayer for Rachel this morning before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together and praise your name. We just want you to be with uh, Rachel as she's uh, going through some tests. Uh, guide the hands of the doctors and, and help to uh, heal her and bring her back to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship this morning. The word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any sword that has two edges. It cuts deep enough to separate soul from spirit. It can separate bones from joints. It judges the thoughts and purposes of the heart. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Because everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Why in my heart I'm listening. is inspired by God and it is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. When you speak Just a word, and suddenly I'm not afraid. Cause when you speak, and freedom reigns, there is hope in every single word you say. I don't want to miss one word you speak. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Everything you say is life to me. Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Why in my heart I'm listening. Why in my heart I'm listening.
I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm listening. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Miss one word you speak. Everything you say is life to me. Grass dries up and flowers may wither, but our God's word will last forever. I am telling you the truth. Those who hear my words and believe in him who sent me have eternal life. We have eternal life, church. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him.
beginning, the word already existed. The, world, the word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was cre created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone.
morning church this is the time in our service where we stop and observe the Lord's Supper which was instituted by Christ and I would like to look at some scriptures from uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 11 and Paul is telling the Corinthians uh, that this was instituted by Christ uh, that his uh, the bread represented his body, that the cup represented his blood that was sacrificed for our sins. But then he adds another scripture at the end of that. It's uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, and he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until his return. Now, the couple things that jump out at me on this is the word proclaim. He doesn't say talk about it. He doesn't say have a conversation over coffee about it. He says, you're proclaiming. This to me is a boldness, a enthusiastic, a, a commitment, a passion about the gospel. That every time you're doing this, that is what you're doing. You're proclaiming the gospel. Then the other thing I'm looking at is why did he add this? You know, I, I'm not found it in other scriptures where it talks about the uh, uh, Last Supper. So I was looking in the previous chapter, chapter 10, and uh, he was telling the Corinthians, hey, look, you got some problems going on. You have two tables in your church. The one table is for the Lord, but the other one is for demons. And he was telling them this because there was a practice at the time of people going out and uh, purchasing food that had been sacrificed to the Gentile pagan gods, bringing it into the church, and people were choosing to sit there and eat, partake of that. And he said, you got to get rid of that. It, it, it's just wrong. So this morning, I am so glad that you guys have chosen to commit yourselves to being here with the body and to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, we just come now. We're just so thankful. Thankful is probably not a strong enough word. That you sent your son to die, give us a plan of salvation, to give us hope and a way out of this world. And all this in your son's name. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ. That was not terribly enthusiastic. Let's try that again. Good morning. We're going to dismiss our kids to Kingdom Kids. Uh, kids, if you want to head out in the back there, head with the lovely Miss Lisa. In case you're new with us, that's my wife. I'm not just calling women lovely. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the empty rows here in the front, and I can only assume that word has gotten out how excited I am about the topic today, and people were afraid that I was just going to be spitting all over them as this message got going today. Uh, guys, we are um, continuing in our series, Beyond Belief, where we're talking about evidences for our faith, reasons to believe what it is we believe. Remember week one, as we gathered together on this, we began speaking about the nature of truth, and we determined that if there is a God, then there is absolute truth, and we can know absolutely things that are true about this cosmos. And the second week we got together, we talked about why something rather than nothing at all, why this particular existence. And in the midst of that, we said that if there is a God behind all of this something, then that God has purposed this universe, and we can know, objectively know, purpose, meaning in this universe. The third week we got together, we began to speak about God revealed through origins, and so we talked about God's evidence for the existence of God through astrophysics, uh, through the cosmos in general, and about the origins of the cosmos in particular. Then we talked about teleology the next week. We looked at the complexity of this universe, and we talked about how complexity is, exemplifies that there must be a God behind this, a great and brilliant God who pieced it all together. Last week as we got together, we talked about how God is evidenced through morality using the axiological argument for the existence of God. If there is no God, then there is no ultimate right and wrong. Today, we are going to begin discussing history, so we're going to be dipping in on history today. I hope you're ready. If you got an outline back there, you might notice something a little bit different. If you didn't get an outline, feel free to grab one at the back of the room. They're in that little blue basket. I will not disdain you if you get up right now and go pick one up that's fine these uh these outlines today this is a first for me this is a front and back outline uh and here's what bodes very poorly for all of you this is only one point oh no uh now i'll try to make the the opening and closing points a little bit brief but uh we've got a lot to dig into today on this issue and believe me, I cut it back and cut it back and cut it back. Our question today is one of history. Would it matter to you if the Bible were shown to be false? Would it matter to you if the Bible were shown to be false? Before we dip in on that issue, let's discuss our scripture passage for the month. Uh, every month, if you're new with us here, we memorize one scripture verse. This is our scripture verse for this month. Uh, I saw the panic look on, some of your, look on some of your faces when I mentioned the scripture verse. You haven't studied yet, have you? All right, uh, let's, let's see how you're doing. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations. You're all like speculating about saying speculations. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of our God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay, so some of you guys are doing okay. Some of you, homework time. Come on, post it, get rolling. Would it matter to you if the Bible were shown to be false? If the narratives that are composed in this, would it matter to you if they were composed hundreds or thousands of years after the time that they were purportedly written by people who weren't there and who didn't know? Would that matter to you? Now, some well-intending Christian, well-meaning Christians will say, no, you know, I, I would just, I would still have faith. I wouldn't. Um, honestly, if, if this was composed in such a way that people who weren't there, who didn't know, put it together, then how could I believe what this says about Jesus? How could I believe what this says about God? So it's really important to me to know that this is historically accurate. And that will be the question we're dealing with today. Richard Dawkins, um, consummate critic of Christianity. And, and you know what? Kudos to Richard Dawkins. Whenever I want the wrong opinion on something, he's my go-to guy. Richard Dawkins has said this about the Bible. He said, the Bible should be taught but emphatically not as reality. 
It is fiction, myth, poetry, anything but reality. As such, it needs to be taught because it underlies so much of our literature and our culture. What's he saying here? He's saying the scriptures are just an interesting myth. They're like Beowulf or something else that we should teach because they're culturally significant, but they're not reality, and no one should approach them as reality. You know what Richard Dawkins is not? <laughs> He's not a historian. He's not a New Testament scholar. He's not a Christian. He's not an archaeologist, which means this. All of that was speaking outside of his field of expertise, as you will soon see. Are the scriptures history? Are the scriptures history? Well, how could we possibly measure such a thing? How could we know whether or not the scriptures are what they claim to be? For years, this was just taken as one of those Christian things you have to deal with. You've just got to take the Bible on faith. You've just got to believe that it's true. And just as the critics were getting more and more vocal, more and more pronounced, something interesting happened. A new realm of academia emerged called archaeology. Archaeology is digging up and finding relics of the past, and it has been one of the greatest friends to Christianity and all of academia, as you'll soon see. What is history and how is it measured? If we're going to discuss history and whether or not this is historically reliable, we should have some criteria, correct? What we're looking for with history is, number one, we're looking for explanatory power. So if we're looking at a narrative, we want to find out whether or not it has the power to explain the historical events it claims to explain. We're also looking for explanatory scope. And that means this, does it explain just one event or does it explain all the events? We're preferring history that explains all of the events. We're also looking for physical evidence so we're looking at archaeology. We're looking for burned out cities, damaged pottery. We're looking for relics that support the event. Um, we're looking for materials from which those relics are produced because materials, you may not realize, help us to date things. We can find if that rock came from that mountain because that mountain was only excavated during this time period. And if we understand those things, then we can really precisely date events. We're looking at patina when we're looking at physical evidence. Everyone say patina. Now, what is patina? Whenever you see writing on any piece of archaeological evidence, that writing is filled with mold and algae and dust, and we can date that to an exact time period. And if the writing is genuine, then it also dates to the time period of the artifact that the writing is found on. So those things are important. We're looking at location. Now, location is actually less important than you might think it would be. When it comes to finding physical evidence, you might think, well, I need to see it come out of the ground. But there's a problem with that. Let's imagine you're digging in the Middle East, and as you excavate something, you look at it and go, wow, this seems historically significant. Do I want to get on the phone with the Israeli antiquities authorities and have them come out and take it, or would I like to sell it for half a million dollars to a collector? You can see where that becomes an issue for a lot of people. They usually rather sell it. So there is this huge antiquities market that is out there where items are being traded and sold because people would rather just make a buck from what it is that they find. We're also looking for outside attestation. So if we want to know if his, something is historically reliable, we're looking not just to see whether or not the people who spoke about it are speaking to the issue, but we're looking for disinterested parties speaking about these issues. We're also looking for antagonists, people who don't like what's going on here, speaking about these issues. We're also looking for eyewitness accounts. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to history, this has all of that, way more so than any other text that is out there. Uh, the scriptural texts are numerous and well-attested themselves. Just getting the actual data from the scripts, it is different than anything else we've ever seen in the ancient world. We discussed this briefly in our feeding series in August, and I don't want to dip too heavily back into that right now, except to say we have vastly more manuscript evidence in way more languages dating closer to the original events than any ancient work of history, by a ton. In his, uh, in his uh, book, Sir Frederick G. Kenyon, The Bible and Archaeology, he wrote this. He's the former director, by the way, and principal librarian of the British Museum. He said this about the New Testament text. 
The interval then between the dates of the original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to as substantially as they were has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. In other words, you can depend on this, that this is reading what was written at the time. That's what you're getting when you're studying the scriptures. And there are differences between this text and any other text that's out there. The differences are hard to ignore. This is a complete work unlike anything else that we've ever seen in the human experience. There are prophetic prophecies in this book and there are fulfillments that we have seen in world history. We don't have time to do those today, but I promise you we will dip into that in the future. There, uh, there's a survival of the Jewish people. Talk about a historic event that needs explained. The Jewish people are people who were removed from their territory and retained their culture for thousands of years. How do you explain that historically? This makes sense of that. There's the emergence of the church against all odds, against total opposition, and despite the fact that it was trying to be squashed throughout history. How do you explain how that happens? Well, this makes sense of that. Beyond that, the story is much better than anything else out there. Uh, let me explain it this way. Imagine all television shows are this. They're a combination of Teletubbies. You guys know what Teletubbies are? <laughs> every television show, every television show is a combination of Teletubbies and like safety videos that you have to watch at, you know, at work, where they show people cutting off their fingers and tell you what not to do or, or you know, talk about inner office stuff. Imagine it's just a, a splicing together of those two genres. That's all television. And so some, one day you're sitting down and you flip on your TV because you're like, I just wonder what's on and maybe I'm, I'm going to treat myself to this awfulness once again. And you flip on your TV and suddenly the screen says, The Lord of the Rings. And then you begin watching the unfolding of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now something in you would go, this is different. What I'm seeing here is completely different or otherly. Now, some of you might know that one of my undergraduate degrees is in comparative religion. So I've read numerous Buddhist, Buddha, uh, Buddhist sutras. I've read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I've read the Quran. I know other religious texts that are out there. There is nothing like the Judeo-Christian Bible. Nothing. That said, these things can all be relegated to the dust and inadequate if I can show that this is contrived. This is just made up. But our God, in his wisdom, knew that this was going to be an issue. And so when our God chose to situate his people on planet Earth, he put them in one of the most arid regions in the entire world. Do you know why? This side of history, it makes sense. Preservation. We have tens of thousands of archaeological evidences that substantiate the scriptures as true. We're going to dip into a portion of those today as we jump into archaeology. Let's pray. Master, um, I know for, for many, some of these things can be a difficult topic, and, and Lord, we just ask again that you would open up our minds to understanding that you would give us wisdom beyond our natural means, that supernaturally you would intervene to help us understand you more, to be excited about you and your word. We love you, Lord, and we offer you this time as worship of the mind, or worship with the mind, rather. It's in your most precious and holy name we pray, Father. Amen. Archaeology. It's not quite Indiana Jones. If, you've, if you're like me, you grew up in the era watching Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you might have thought at some stage of the game, I'd love to be an archaeologist. I mean, these guys have to defeat traps, and then they get to find these cool golden artifacts, and, uh, and then they get to take them, and sometimes supernatural things happen. It's pretty awesome. Not the way real archaeology works. You can't just decide you're going to go find something. That's not the way archaeology happens. Archaeology is less like a treasure hunt. It is more like going through an ancient garbage dump. In fact, that's most of what archaeology is. It's looking at dumps for cast-offs uh, cast that people have left behind. Edwin Yamauchi, uh, one of the greatest historians of the Middle East, he wrote a book called Persia and the Bible. Um, I, I had the pleasure, at Miami, he was teaching at Miami University when I was there, and I had the pleasure of sitting in and listening to this guy speak. He would be speaking in English, and he'd write in different languages. He knew like eight ancient languages, including one language that only like six people in the world could deal with. 
brilliant guy. He says about archaeology, he says this, really what you're doing in archaeology is you're trying to recover a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the things that were available at the time. Broken up pieces, little tidbits, little small fragments, and then piecing together history. Physicist and chemist and apologist Dr. John Bloom, who also happens to be an archaeologist in his spare time, it's a busy man, he expresses the dilemma this way. Imagine your house, visualize your house, okay? Now I want you to imagine what you would expect to find from your home if today it were ransacked and pillaged by a regional gang who then set it on fire and burned it to the ground. And then afterward, several other gangs came through and over the course of years went through the rummage of whatever was left of your house, searching it for valuables. And then they, uh, the burned area had been combed over again by a regional gang. And then it was subject to the elements for decades and then centuries. And then it was buried and then subject to earthquakes and rainwater in 3,000 years of human history. Do you imagine there would be anything left? Again, this is the difficulty. And it's really cool that our God put, because the, 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 the biggest enemy for archaeology is water. Our God situated himself in a region that was arid, that was very dry. So what are we looking for with archaeology? We're looking for defeaters, number one. Here are what defeaters are. Some way to overcome the existing narrative. If there's a story, if I can find one artifact that disproves that story, then I don't have to find tons of artifacts that support that story. So when most people are doing biblical archaeology, they're looking for reasons to not trust the Bible. That's important. They're also looking for evidences that support it um, but not as much. It's not as interesting for them. And they're look, looking for obscure evidences. Here's what I mean by that. Some things you would like to find because they would be super fascinating. For instance, in the Palace of David, we would love to find on the bathroom wall, King David was here. <laughs> but you're never going to find something like that. So what is very interesting to historians and archaeologists is when they find something they totally did not expect. Something that informs us of the situation that maybe even embellishes and helps us to understand things that were in these texts. And we find tons of that stuff in biblical archaeology. Now I've mentioned that there are tens of thousands of finds. There are literally finds happening all the time. We are in, if you're an archaeologist and into archaeology, if you're an archaeology nerd, this is probably the best time in human history to be alive. Because there are periodicals that are actually devoted to new finds. We're coming across new stuff all the time. That said, we're going to briefly move through a whole series of archaeological finds just through biblical history. And I mean briefly. If you want to get into this more, if you reach the end of this and you're like, I need more, <laughs> most of you probably won't be there. Uh, but if that's you, here's a book I just read. Uh, this is a fantastic book for your bathroom or your coffee table. Uh, probably not both. You know, choose one or the other. Uh, but this is a book by Titus Kennedy called Unearthing the Bible, and they're literally just like two-page snippets on archaeological finds. It's 101 archaeological finds that really inform the way you see and understand the Bible. Really fascinating stuff. Okay, get ready for a drink from the fire hose. Archaeology in Scripture. Here we go. We're going to start by talking about the pre-flood era. Now, that is old. That's going way back. And you might be thinking to yourself, we can't possibly have anything from the pre-flood era. After all, that was a bit of a disaster. If, if water is an enemy to finds, then we should find nothing pre-flood. We actually do have things that we, that we know were pre-flood. For instance, uh, the Sphinx in Egypt. Um, have you ever noticed the Sphinx head does not look like it fits with the rest of the body? That's because it doesn't. That head was added later on because the original head broke off. Everything below the head is water damaged, severely water damaged in Egypt. That should be a big deal. Now, what you're seeing on the screen behind me right now is a cuneiform clay block that we have discovered from 2000 BC. It was discovered in Iraq. And this is the list of Sumerian kings by name. Now, this is a long time after the flood, so you might be going, what significance does this have to the flood? Well, it's, it's rather interesting because it lists eight kings, and after these eight kings, it then says, and then the flood waters passed over, and then the, the, uh, the capital was moved to Kish because the, capital, the former capital was gone. All right? 
Eight kings, the floodwaters passed over, the capital had to be moved to Kish. Now that's interesting, but what's more interesting is they give us the ages of the kings. Unfortunately for us, the ages are not in years because they did not use years to date people in the system. But here's what we know. The ages of the eight kings before the flood were dramatically multiples longer than the kings who came after the flood. Now, if you've read your flood narrative in the scriptures, here's what you see. Lifespans before the flood were very long, and right after the flood, lifespans, boom, plummeted. That's exactly what we see in this alternative record. And again, that has nothing to do with the Bible. These are not a people group who were informing the, or informing the scriptures at all. After the flood, you'll remember, um, oh, I should mention this as well. There are numerous flood accounts. So we have the Enuma Elish, which is a Babylonian flood epic. We've got the Atrahasas, which is a Mesopotamian and Akkadian uh, flood epic. And we've also uh, got the Deucalion, which is a Greek flood epic. We've also got numerous other flood epics from different cultures. Now, many critics of the Hebrew scriptures said, ah, see, you guys copied your scriptures off of these other groups because these people groups are older. So you got your flood narrative from these people. Not so. Let me, consider, let me have you consider an alternative explanation. If the flood epic is true, then we are all descended from Noah. You ever heard grandpa tell a story? Great grandpa tell a story? Have you ever heard grandpa tell a story from great, great, great grandpa? Do you think the flood epic would be one that ever died out? I mean, that would be conveyed from generation to generation. If this happened, and we're all descended from a common ancestor, we should expect flood epics all over the place. And guess what we have? Flood epics all over the place. You might say we're flooded by them. That was, you know, I could hear it coming out of my mouth. I was like, stop it. Don't, don't do it. Can only be a dad so long before that garbage starts happening. Yeah. (laughs) Let it flow. (laughs) Um, After the flood, you'll remember that God had told the people, he said, go forth, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And all the humans went, "Mm, I don't like that idea. Instead, let's gather together and build a city for ourselves that our name may never be forgotten. We'll build a tower that goes up to the heavens. You remember the Tower of Babylon epic. Well, we've got the Bible's version, but here's what we've discovered recently, the Enmarkar epic. This is an account which is a uh, composite of 27 different tablets and fragments discovered at at least three different locations in Mesopotamia. The epic takes place in a city called Eridu. Most people who study the region believe Eridu is the oldest city in human history, the oldest city in the world. Now, here's what we know about Eridu. It was located in the place called Uruk, and in the Bible, it's named as Erech, right? It's the same territory. Uh, That is the region that Nimrod in the Bible settled in and decided to build his city in. And again, this non-biblical paradigm describes the same location. But here's what's interesting about this. You see this structure in the lower left hand? This is called a ziggurat. Everyone say ziggurat. (laughs) Ziggurat is a stepped pyramid. In the ancient world, these are built all over the place. We've got them in North and South America. Um, They're all throughout the Middle East and even over in China. They're all over the world. The idea is it's like a man-made mountain that we can ascend. It's like a temple and a holy place all in one, and it gets you closer to the gods, and it makes the gods have to hear you. Well, in this region, in Eridu, we have the largest foundation of a ziggurat that we have ever discovered, and here's what's interesting about it. It's unfinished. They started building this elaborate, huge tower, and they, they did not finish. They did not complete but it gets even more interesting. According to the Enmarkar epic, there is this phrasing about language. They had this weird concern about language. It says the following, the whole universe, may they all address Enlil, who is a god, may they all address address Enlil together in a single language. For at, at that time, some future time, Inki shall change the speech in their mouths as many as had been placed there so that the speech of mankind may be truly one. This records, you remember what happened at Babel, right? The separation of the languages and the scattering of the peoples. It's almost like they have a national embarrassment that they've got the, spin do- the religious spin doctors working on going, but you know, at some future time, all the languages will be brought back together in this place. A- again, you're looking for obscure information. It's like they're responding to some national tragedy that had occurred. Fascinating stuff. 
Well, let's flash forward to the time of the patriarchs. You remember the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We found something called the Lament for Ur. Everyone say Ur. What a great name for a city. Where do you live? Ur. Ur at this time was uh, probably the largest city in the world. Approximately 65,000 people lived there. And we know somebody important who lived at Ur. I'll tell you about him in just a moment. But the lament of Ur is a lament of a city being destroyed. And here's what it says. Um, It's graphic poetic language. Probably stuff you did not think you'd hear at church this, this day. Uh, The temples were ruined. The corpses were piled at the gates. Severed heads were scattered on the streets. Bodies decomposed in the sun. Families are burned in their houses. People have died of hunger. Treasuries were defiled and stolen. Now, the fall of Ur took place over a long period of time. This is lamenting the final destruction of the city by another nation. But the, the lament contains the idea that this was a long time in coming. And so people began leaving the city. This happened right at the time a man by the name of Terah took his son Abram and left Ur to go to settle in Haran. This explains why Terah would have left Ur. Again, it's not something that you would expect to find, not something you're looking for, but when you find it, you go, whoa, that is cool. This gets better. So what happens when you hate somebody? How do you get back at them? Don't answer that. Uh, (laughs) In this day and age, in in the the time of the patriarchs, if you were really angry at somebody, you needed to curse them. And here's how you did it. You would get a piece of clay and you would scribe the name of that person or that people group into the clay. And then you'd fire it. So it became like a potsherd. And then you'd attack it with a spear and you'd club it and you'd burn it in the fire and you'd spit on it and you'd stomp on it. And in so doing, you would curse whoever that was. Well, guess who got a lot of cursing during this time in history? The Canaanites. Everybody around the region hated the Canaanites. Now you might be thinking, well, what's that have to do with anything? They record a lot of very important names for Bible history. They hated them. So, for instance, what kinds of of names do we see? Um, We have 60 names of people's places uh, mentioned in the Bible, including Laish, Shechem, Salem, that is Jerusalem. We have the name Abraham cursed. We have Zebulon. We even have Job as one of the targets of curses. It's like, who would target Job? He's such a sweet guy. Well, it might not be the actual Job, might not be the actual Abraham that we know from scriptures, but it does tell us that the name was in the land and was being used. So again, very interesting things. From curses come blessings, as it were. Let's discuss the Code of Hammurabi. There was a Babylonian ruler in the 1700s BC, uh, and he put together this stele, this uh, set of laws. This would be like if, uh, if somebody from today found a set of laws in like Indiana. It might tell us a few things about how people in Ohio operated because there was generally a, a kind of a similar understanding of laws. And that's exactly what it does. It corroborates inheritance regulations we see in the Bible. It describes why a person might be denied their birthrights and what birthrights look like, just as we see them trotted out in Scripture. But here's something more interesting. It tells us a slave price. Now, you might not think that's very important. It's very important. Slavery was ubiquitous in this world up until, uh, really, it was overturned in the last couple hundred years. When I say ubiquitous, it was in every culture everywhere. And so one of the best ways we have of dating things is by slave prices. We can tell slave prices run on a steady curve up and down throughout history. Now, here's what we know about Hammurabi. Before he lived, the slave prices were 10 to 15 shekels. After he lived, the price shot up to 30 to 50 shekels. Why should that matter? Because right when he was alive, someone important was sold into slavery. Joseph. Hammurabi records that a slave price for a buyer was 20 shekels of silver during his life. And guess what Joseph was sold for? 20 shekels of silver. Dead on the biblical narrative at that particular time, exactly as the scriptures recount it. How about camels? I know you all came in here wondering this morning about camels. How about camels? One of the early criticisms of the Bible was they said the Bible can't be valid, it can't be true, because it keeps recording people riding camels. It says like, and Rebecca alit upon a camel, 
which is not a reference to smoking. But it talks about camels and camel usage, and here's what they said. Camels were not used until thousands of years later. The Bible totally misses the mark. Clearly, it was contrived much later, and people interpreted things for things that, that happened long before this. And then we started finding things like this camel cylinder. I don't know if you can see what that is. It's two people sitting on the back of a two-humped camel facing each other. It looks like they're having tea or something. But we started finding this, and then we started finding more and more examples of these things. We found camel carts. We found visual depictions of people riding camels. We found camel bones in human settlements. We found fabrics woven with camel hair, all in territories surrounding this region and even preceding the patriarchs. And so the critics shut up about that. The gold of valor. There was this interesting thing that was happening in Egyptian art for the, during the time of the patriarchs. The gold of valor is what it came to be known as. We were shown these depictions of pharaohs bestowing the highest honor they could bestow on a human being. It was called the gold of valor. They're presenting a golden necklace. They're putting it around the person that they're trying to honor. Now, what is interesting about this comes from Genesis 41, verse 42. You've probably never seen this in your Bible. Genesis 41, 42, Joseph has just interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. And he told Pharaoh about how Pharaoh could go ahead and overcome this famine. And here's what we read. The Pharaoh took off his signet ring and put it on the hand, uh, or put it on his hand and, and put it on Joseph's hand. He, cl he uh, clothed him in fine garments, and then he put the gold necklace around his neck. It's not a gold necklace. It's the gold necklace. The gold of valor. What is being described here is a specific instance that only lasted during those period of the patriarchs. You wouldn't know about that if you'd written two or three hundred years after the fact and had not been informed by God about what transpired. Again, it sets it cleanly in the time period. Well, let's move forward from the time of the patriarchs. You remember Joseph ended up in Egypt, and then he brought his whole family out, and they began living in Egypt. And for a long time, they thrived in Egypt, but something happened. Historically, we, we imagine the Hyksos, which were another Semitic people group, came over and overthrew Egypt. The, the Hyksos looked like Jews. And so after the Hyksos were kicked out, the Egyptians looked around and went, you look like those people who used to torment us and took over our region. And so they began to target the Jewish people. And the Jewish people moved from a position of power to a position of slavery. It fits perfectly within this time period. But in their condition of slavery, we move up to the Pharaoh, Thutmosis III. This is the tomb of Rechmir. What you're seeing on the right here are depictions of slaves making bricks for public works. Thutmosis III was probably the Pharaoh who uh, Moses was in the household of. Listen to the name Thutmosa. It was a family name. Moses was drawn from the Nile and given the name Moses and would have been part of that family. And as such, here we see this is literally probably a depiction of Israelites actually slaving away, making bricks. Beyond this, though, we have a, a find called the Louvre scroll or the Louvre uh, leather roll, which was from the period of Thutmosis III and his successor, Amenhotep II. In this period, we are told that at one stage of the game, Pharaoh demanded the slaves make bricks without the sufficient resources. And when they were unable to meet their quotas, they were beaten and chastised severely. That's exactly what we found in the Bible record. It's the way the Bible records it. Now, here's where this gets really fascinating. The Ippowar text. This is awesome. The Ippowar text, the Ippowar papyrus or Ippowar scroll, we only have one copy of this. It dates back to the 13th century BC. That is very old. But it recounts a time a little bit before then, um, around middle of the 15th century BC, right when the Exodus would have just ha had happened and we'd moved past it. Listen to this. This is an Egyptian describing something bad that happened to Egypt. Ready? The river is blood. And there is blood, blood everywhere, plague and pestilence throughout the land. The grain is destroyed. Disease is causing physical disfigurement. And there is death. There is mourning throughout the land. Children have died. Our children have died. The authority of the Pharaoh is lost. The gods of Egypt are ineffective. They're losing a battle. And listen to this last line. 
And now our jewelry is in the possession of slaves. That is the Exodus story told from the Egyptian standpoint. You remember the last thing that they're told, the Israelites are told before they leave, go to your neighbors and request their jewelry and their, their gold and their silver, and you will pillage them as you leave. Because the, the Egyptians were like, here, take this. Just, just get out of here. We need you to leave. So that the Israelites looted the Egyptians on their way out. That is the story. Is that not incredible? We also have the elephantine steel. Um, Amenhotep II is probably the best candidate we have for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Amenhotep II, just make a note of it. By the way, if you've read anything on this issue that is older than like 20 years old, you're probably out of date. So much archaeology has been discovered at this stage of the game. We know tons more now than we used to on this issue. Amenhotep II, you'll remember that the Pharaoh of the Exodus uh, seemed to be a rather arrogant human being. Listen to Amenhotep II describe himself. He said, I am able to uh, shoot a, an arrow through a copper target, a palm thick. I can row a ship faster than can 200 Egyptian sailors. By himself, faster and farther, I'm sorry, further as well. Um, he said, I have single-handedly killed seven prince warriors of Kadesh. I have received tribute from the kings of Babylon and the Hittites and the Mitanni. Uh, does this sound like somebody who might have a little bit of a hard heart to start with, even if God amplifies it? Now, here's what's fascinating about this guy. He only had two military campaigns. For Egyptian pharaohs, this is unheard of. The first campaign took, on, took place very early on in his reign. And in that campaign, he had a reasonable conquest. But if you've got a good army, the very best campaigns you can have are ones where you overthrow another army. That's the biggest feat, the biggest accomplishment. He only had one of those, and it happened before the Exodus. What happened after the Exodus? A lot of silence. But here's what we read on the elephantine steel. He brags about his next big conquest. This monumental stone inscription recounts the most massive slave raid in world history, though it might be a dramatic exaggeration. Slave capturing is like the low-hanging fruit for military exploits in the ancient world. You're basically taking your military and you're grabbing people on the outskirts and taking them as slaves. He claimed to have captured 101,128 captives to be used as slaves. To give you a sense of how many that is, the next highest slave uh, Slave grab that we ever see in Egyptian history is 5,903 people. Here's the question it begs. Why not more military exploits? Did something happen to your military? I don't know, were they drowned in the Red Sea? And beyond that, why the need for so many slaves? Did you lose some slaves? Could it be that your entire slave force just wandered off and now you're trying your best to salvage your country? That's exactly what it looks like. But it gets better regarding Amenhotep II. Um, he had a son who inherited after him. His son should have been Amenhotep III, but instead it was Thutmosis IV. Now, if you've ever seen the Sphinx, you know it's got those kind of paws standing out front. And in between the paws, there's this big a uh, big stone that contains some script on it. Have you ever seen that? That's known as the Dream Steely. The Dream Steely recounts Thutmosis IV inheritance of power. He said that he was out sleeping in the desert, in a tent in the desert, and the Sphinx demanded that it be dug up because it was buried in the sand. And so he dug up and dedicated the Sphinx, but he said he wanted to, he, he basically was giving gratitude to the deities. Do you know why? Because his position of inheriting Pharaoh was the result of deity intervention. Apparently, somebody had, some deity had killed his oldest brother, the firstborn of his family. Does that sound familiar? The plague of slaughtering the firstborns, that's exactly as it's described in scriptures. The next Amenhotep had died somehow, tragically, and Thutmosis IV inherited rather than his older brother. Let's flash forward to the period of conquest. You guys will remember that after the Israelites escape, they go and they, they go to Mount Sinai and God delivers his message to them. He speaks to them his word and he says, go up and take Canaan. And the people go up to the edge of Canaan and they're like, we're not going in there. And so God goes, you're right, you're not going in there. Go wander around the wilderness for 40 years. 
And so he makes them go wander in the wilderness. But after that time period is done, the Israelites begin moving up past uh, the, the Dead Sea and on up uh, to the east side of the Jordan River. As that is happening, there's a man named Balaam. You remember this story? And Balaam is hired by local kings. They say, Balaam, you're a prophet. You are in with the deities. You go and you curse the Israelites. Place a curse upon them. And so Balaam seeks out the deities that apparently were ruling Israel. And God, the God, says to him, don't you dare. And then God says, you know what? Go ahead and dare. Try it. And so Balaam goes up and he stands on a high mountain and he tries to level a curse against Israel. And what comes out of his mouth is a blessing. He just blesses this people group. And so he's like, well, maybe this mountain isn't working. Maybe that God is strong here. So I'll go to a different mountain where that God is not strong. And he goes to another mountain and he tries again and he tries to curse and all that comes out of his mouth, blessings. We have discovered the Balaam inscription. This is a text that consists of over 119 fragments and it relates how a name, a man named Balaam, son of Beor, that's the exact name used in your Bible, it relates how he is, and he's a seer, he is a prophet, and it talks about how he got a divine message from the gods, it particularly mentions El. El spoke to him and said to this to him, darkness and chaos is coming into your realm because I'm, these powerful deities are moving in. Something powerful is coming. And so Balaam tried to dissuade the deities to no avail. He could not convince the God to stop. And so Balaam went to the people and said, we're going to be utterly destroyed. We've got to get out of here. And the people would not listen to him. And they rejected Balaam. Numbers 22 is where that is recounted. Exactly as what the scripture said. And from a different culture, Balaam was later on killed by the Israelites. What about Jericho? Eventually, the Israelites get up to where they're about to enter the land. You remember, they cross over the Jordan River. It's a miraculous crossing. And as they cross over the Jordan River, they come into the territory. The first city they're up against is Jericho, and it was terrifying because its walls were impressive. We've excavated Jericho. This is a depiction of what Jericho looks like. If, you're, if you can see the picture here, you see kind of the lighter brown area underneath the walls. That's a plateau area. Jericho, think of Jericho as being positioned on a plateau. So it's already elevated. The whole city's elevated. And what they did was they plastered the rock walls all the way up to the base of their walls. So this wall from the plain below would, would be the equivalent of like 30 feet tall, which in the ancient world was unassailable. You couldn't do anything about that. Not only did it have a wall, but it had a double wall. There was a wall on top and the wall within the, com the complex. An archaeologist by the name of John Garstang excavated this. And here's what he found. The walls fell outward and downward, and where they fell formed a natural ramp that got the Israelites onto the plateau. When you read the Bible depiction, read carefully. It said, and the walls fell down, and the Israelites went in, each one up and in. It is the exact description of the way we found the city destroyed. That's how they got up and into the city. Now, years later, and some of you who went to college maybe in the uh, somewhere between the 50s and 80s, you might be thinking, yeah, but we found out that was fake because a woman named Kathleen Kenyon came along and said, nope, the Bible narrative is off by 150 years. They missed the mark. And so all the universities rapidly went to embrace it and went, yes, Kathleen Kenyon has decisively shown that Garstang's work was false until Kathleen Kenyon was shown to be a fraud and actually did not account for all the materials she found. Now Garstang's original model, exactly what we see here, exactly what we see described in the scriptures, has been authenticated, and here's what's even better. We found different names of pharaohs all the way up to Thutmosis IV, which helps us decisively place the invasion of the land at the pharaoh who was the inheritor of Amenhotep II. Awesome. All right, maybe you don't think so. I think this is amazing. Right around the 1400s, we start seeing this huge amount of missives, of letters being written back and forth between people in the land of Canaan and from the people of Canaan to the land of Egypt, where they're going, Egypt, help us. You have to help us. There's this people coming in here called the Hapiru. The Hapiru are invading the land and the, the Canaanites are yelling at each other and like, you're conspiring with the Hapiru. You are giving them land. Well, who are the Hapiru? Hebrews. 
the Hebrew people were overthrowing the land of Canaan, and Canaan was thrown into absolute disarray. And we've got all these missives that explain that that is what's going on. Well, after the Hebrews settle in the land, we have the time of the Judges. Uh, if you've ever read the book of Judges, it's a pretty dark book, right? Pretty dark time in history. Um, in the time of the Judges, we have Egypt, and they mention that Israel is the dominant people group in the, in the realm of the Canaanites. Which means that within a generation, the Israelites went from not being Canaanites to being the people controlling Canaan. How could that have happened? Exactly what is in your Bible took place. They conquered the land. Let's talk about the mysterious Pim. I know you all came in here thinking, I hope we talk about the mysterious Pim. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 21, there was this text that we could not figure out how to translate for the longest time. It, it said this, it used a word, Pim, and nobody knew what Pim meant. It said, and this, this is how it was translated, it is a Pim for a plowshare and a sickle and a pitchfork and an axe. It's a Pim for that. And everybody's like, what does that mean? What is that even talking about? Until we found these stones and we started finding them all over the land. That says, Pim. It's a weight. It was that weight worth of silver for an Israelite to go get their, their plows or their sickles or their pitchforks sharpened by a Philistine. That's the kind of detail that nobody's looking for, but when you find it, you go, that makes sense of the text. This is amazing. All right, um, let's move forward to the period of the kings. King David, for the longest time, was suspected of being, by most Bible critics, a fraud. They went, this guy's like a King Arthur figure. He's not real. Like, he's just contrived. He's made up by the Jewish people. If there ever was somebody like a David, he was probably like a tribal chieftain. But it can't be what we see in the, in the Old Testament text. That kind of King David never lived. In 1993, there was a, uh, there was a, a fine called the Tel Dan Steely. Now, if you're an ancient conqueror and you go and you wipe out a city and you want to make sure that city pays its taxes, you set up a stone outside of the city where you inform them of how cool you are and how dangerous you are to cross and how much better you are than everybody else around you. Well, we found one of those in the region surrounding it. And this particular individual is bragging about what he has done. And here's what he says. Uh, he says, uh, where we go? There we are. He says, I have conquered Jehoram of Israel and Ahaziah, Ahaz of Judah. But what's fascinating is it records Ahaziah is from the Bwit Dewid, house of David, the dynasty of David. In other words, it's not just an acknowledgement that we've killed, we've fought against and beat these guys, but these guys are part of that radical, amazing lineage, the lineage of David. William uh, G. Deaver, who is a scholar specialized in archaeology in this area, he says, here's what we now know about David, confidently from archaeology. He did exist in the 10th century. He started a dynasty that the surrounding countries were very well aware of. He expanded his capital. Jerusalem expanded. His kingdom grew. New cities were established in his time. He strengthened his borders. We've actually found forts on all the borders surrounding it, particularly on the borders with the Philistines. He won battles. Pottery deposits show that surrounding cultures, particularly the Philistines, were being pushed out of their territories, just like what is described in the Bible. His dynasty lasted for centuries as evidenced by pottery styles used in the region and in trade from the region. We now know a ton about King David. He's legit. But then we have the divided kingdom. After the time of David, you remember, uh, after the Solomon's reign, Rehoboam took over, and, and then the kingdom, the kingdom was divided into a northern and southern kingdom. Well, Jeroboam became the first king of the northern kingdom. And we found this. This is a jasper carved lion, and it reads, belonging to Shema, servant of Jeroboam. This is from Jeroboam's chief servant. This is his stamp that he could use to inscribe things to say, I have authority in this place. We've actually got that. It's amazing. We've also found uh, archaeological evidences of the name Elisha, uh, the name Ahab. We've got ivory furniture from Ahab's palace. By the way, if you wanted to get ivory, you had to go through Phoenicia. And Ahab had a connection to Phoenicia, his wife Jezebel. All makes sense. 
we have uh, the black obelisk of Shalmaneser. I don't know if I mentioned this yet. Uh, Jehu, who is a commander in uh, the army of Ahaz, was one of three people charged by Elisha to uh, destroy, to overthrow Ahaz and his wife Jezebel. Jehu is the guy who threw Jezebel out of a window to her death. See this guy bowing down in the middle here, kissing the feet of Shalmaneser III? That's Jehu. This reads, King Jehu, is, he's offering tribute. He's coming before Shalmaneser, who is a more powerful king, and offering tribute to him. You don't get many photographs of ancient biblical characters, but that's Jehu. Awesome. Let's talk Hezekiah's religious purge. Hezekiah was a great king. Um, he was a good man who got rid of a, a whole lot of paganism in his culture. See this altar? Bible question for you. Is that altar legal? By God's law. No, it is not. No, it absolutely is not. Exodus 20 describes what kind of altar you could make as a personal altar. Um, look at verse 25 of Exodus chapter 20. He says, If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones. For if you wield a tool on it, you will profane it. This altar, here's how we found it. All those blocks were ripped apart violently. And they had been used to build a wall in the time of King Hezekiah which means this is part of Hezekiah's purge. This is when Hezekiah sent out the people to go, tear down all those altars. And they tore them down and they went, I may as well use the stones. And so they put them in a wall. Awesome. Isaiah seal. A very significant trove of artifacts was found outside of an area known as the Royal Bakery in Jerusalem. If you're part of the, the, the palace and palace life, guess who you're constantly sending letters to? The bakery. Hey, you need some food. We're going to have a party. Hey, you need some food. I'm entertaining a guest. And so you'd send, send these letters to the bakery, and the bakery had to dispose of them, so they just toss them out in their garbage heap. We found that garbage heap. And so here's, here's the deal. When, a, when an official, a leader in a palace, had something important to say or something that they wanted to show, this is of me, rather than signing a signature, they had a seal, and they would press their seal into a lump of clay, and those lumps of clay are preserved. And so we have what are called boule, these clay preservations of these seals. This one in particular I want to point out to you right now says this, la yesa nebya, belonging to the prophet Isaiah. That was made by the hand of the prophet Isaiah. How cool. By the way, in that same trove, they also found Hezekiah, who, remember, Isaiah and Hezekiah, Isaiah was Hezekiah's right-hand man. Hezekiah went to Isaiah for all his information, so it places the two of them together in the same place at the same time. You'll remember the Babylonian conquest when the Babylonians came in and they overthrew um, the people of Jerusalem. We found another bulla. In fact, we found two of them that are identical from the same person. The bulle, these clay impressions, they read, belonging to Baruch Yahu, son of Neriah, the scribe. If you've studied your Bible, you know something. Jeremiah did not write his own prophecy. He recited it to a scribe, but not just any scribe. He recited it to Baruch, son of Neriah, this guy. We have two clay seal impressions from Baruch. This, this is the guy who wrote down Jeremiah's words in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 32 says this, Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the scribe, and he wrote on it at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the book that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. Now, I'd love to dip into the New Testament era. Let me just say this. Um, the Old Testament archaeology finds are significant, but they're a bit more sparse. Once we come to the New Testament, we have thousands and thousands of and thousands of verifying pieces of evidence concerning the New Testament text. I'll just mention regarding Jesus very quickly. Uh, Flavius Josephus was a um, he was a Jewish historian, and he wrote for Rome. And you see, this is in red and black. Those red portions, many people think, might have been a later addition by a Christian scribe who was going through and like, I want to make sure everybody knows who Jesus really was, and then added his own remarks. So let's not read those red parts. Let's just read the black parts. If you read the red parts, and that did come from 
uh, Josephus, that's a big deal, but let's just read the black parts. Let's assume the most critical version of this. Listen to what Josephus says about Jesus. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, that is the leaders of the Jews, when Pilate had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. That is the historical narrative of what's happening in the New Testament church. And it's given by a non-Christian. We'll roll on here, and I'll just uh, say this. Dr. Patrick Zucheron, another expert on the region, said this. There are over 39 extra-biblical sources that attest to over 100 facts regarding the life and teaching of Jesus. Extra-biblical sources talking about Jesus. We've got to wrap up because I'm going a long time. I know you're feeling it. Um, Acts, uh, let's see, information supporting Acts and Luke. I just want to mention Sir William Ramsay, one of the most famous archaeologists in history, set out to disprove the New Testament. And after he began digging, he went, oops, because he found everything just as it was mentioned in the book of Acts and the travels of Paul and in the gospel of Luke. Everything seemed to be occurring. With the exception of, I think, two very small towns, we have identified every single place mentioned in those books, archaeologically speaking. Um, Sir William Ramsay said, Luke is a historian of first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, he should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Ian Blakelock, another expert in the ancient world, said this, For accuracy of detail and evocation of atmosphere, Luke stands, in fact, with Thucydides. The Acts of the Apostles is not the shoddy product of pious imaginings, but a trustworthy record. It was the spade work of archaeology which first revealed this truth. I'm just going to blast through the early church and not say anything about this. Let me just say this. We have tons of stuff on this. If you want to know more, dig in on New Testament archaeology. There's tons. Um, this was a quote by Pliny the Younger. We'll bypass that. And Tacitus, uh, both people who were speaking about the early church and what it was doing from a non-Christian perspective. Let me wrap up by saying this. This has the fingerprint of God upon it. This is not a fictional work. The spate of archaeology has determined that it is the case. It has verified things which we have believed are true from the scriptural text. We have the testimony of the text himself, and as Jesus said, his word will never disappear. We have the testimony of the stones. One last quote I want to read to you from Nelson Gluick. This is, again, another one of the foremost scholars. He was actually based here at uh, Hebrew Union College. He's a rabbi and archaeologist. Here's what he said. Listen carefully to this. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a Bible reference. Never. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. We have, in addition to this, the testimony and fulfillment of prophecy. I promise we'll do that another time. We have the witness, the inner witness, the Holy Spirit as we read these texts. If a person desires to discount the scriptures, if you want to deny the God of the scriptures, you can do so because you don't like the message. You can do so because you don't like the possibility of the supernatural. You can do so because the idea of the God of the Bible scares you to death, but you cannot do so because we lack historical reliability or archaeological and historic credibility. If people fail to praise, even the rocks cry out. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for your word. And thank you, Father, that you left yourself a witness even in the soil, that you set up a situation where we would be able to affirm and affirm and affirm your word and its historical veracity. God, we praise you for that. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ today that we would walk forth from here uh, at least having a better knowledge of what we believe and why we should believe it. We love you, O oh Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Ben, that was great. Um, you're such a, uh, a history nerd. Uh, uh, but it takes one to know one. I have a couple examples. Uh, when you had the picture of the PIM, PIM up there, uh, that stone with the engraving written on it, uh, the first thing that I thought of was uh, sling ammunition. When David, uh, you know, used the rocks, um, armies of the time, um, would make sling shot uh, either, either out of clay 
or out of lead, and they would put little inscriptions on there like, take that, or ouch, or your mother, really, back then. It was very, very cool. Um, and beyond that, um, we're going to get back to this eventually, but um, if you've been here in the past and taken one of my life groups, uh, the name of my life group uh, is usually Creators of the Lost Arts. So I'm, I'm just as nerdy or worse. Um, <laughs> that too. <laughs> okay. Communication card. Uh, you can do this. Uh, you can sign up on this online, but if you have a communication card, if you would um, leave that on the seat, we'll, we'll pick that up. Uh, one of the shepherds um, will or somebody will pick that up. Um, please fill one of those out. We need to know if you have prayer requests or praises. Uh, the shepherds meet on Saturdays, and we pray over these. Um, it just lets us know who's here and what the needs are in the church. Um, if you're a first-time visitor, um, there is a small booklet out in the foyer um, called Heaven. Um, one of the shepherds here, Mike, um, has a life group that he does on heaven. It's absolutely amazing. Um, you don't have to be a first-time visitor for that, too. If you want to, if you want to get one, and you've been here for a while. Please stop and get one of those. Um, offering. We have a box right there between the doors on the way out of the sanctuary. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Um, ministry teams. We're just about at the end of. We're wrapping up. Uh, signing up for uh, ministry, team, ministry teams. If you um, have an idea, um, if you um, want to lead a, a ministry, if you, if, if you feel that you have a calling, go out there and look at those uh, sign-ups. Um, there's probably something there that you can sign up for that, that meets that. If not, write something in. Because we're, uh, we're going to reach out to the community here uh, more than we ever have. And that is probably the, the best way we're going to get there. This church is just uh, amazing and growing. Um, please write legibly when you sign up. Um, we need to know who you are and what your name and phone number or uh, email would be. Um, yesterday... <laughs> Uh, the fellowship, the, the communion that we have. just the fellowship but the uh the cornhole uh, and and thank you gene that was that was amazing he he's uh he does grounds here and he organized that that was just that was cool um if you didn't get a chance to get over to uh the children's games um we were doing bowling and ring toss but the bowling if the kids they would call a number of pins that they had to knock down they got two tries to knock it down if they won uh, they would get to pick a marble or um, a uh, buffalo Indian head nickel, the original ones, not the newer ones. Um, and archaeologists in the future are going to dig around here, and they're going to find a spot where somebody literally lost all their marbles. Uh, there are marbles all over the grounds now, I'm sure. Um, 
yesterday, well, actually Friday, um, Ferris and I stayed here uh, overnight, and uh, we were setting things up, cleaning up the grounds a little bit, uh, the fire pit, and um, we have, uh, the shepherds have a uh, prayer meeting, prayer time on Saturday mornings, and even though I was already on the grounds, I was 15 minutes late to that, I'm late to everything, but uh, Kevin Pearson has the huddle. There are a lot of, uh, of things going on in this church um, that you can get plugged into, and please do that. But yesterday, when, after the shepherds uh, had their prayer time, uh, I always come over here to the, the men's group, and Kevin uh, mentioned me, and people have said a lot of things about me, but Kevin was saying some things, complimentary things that kind of embarrassed me, but it was things I hadn't heard anybody say before. So I was getting kind of puffed up and uh, had my chest out and everything. So I get ready and go over and start setting the, the bowling up, and George Goforth comes over. He always saves me. <laughs> he comes over and helps me get everything lined up and ready to go. Um, and his grandson, Miles, uh, I love when God uses kids to bring you back down to earth and humble you. Um, so I had jeans and a t-shirt. My hair's all messed up. I had grass stains all over my knees from crawling around and getting all of this ready. And Miles walks over and he says, hi, Mr. Howard. What happened to you? You look terrible. <laughs> so it, kids are great. <laughs> um, back to sign-ups. Trunk and Treat is coming up in about, what's that, two weeks, the 24th uh, of October. And we need more volunteers. We need about 50 volunteers. We only have about 25, 28 signed up. Maybe after first service, we have a few more. Um, please sign up for that. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, but we need lots of volunteers. And we still need people to um, dress up the trunks of their cars and hand out candy. Um, that is always amazing to see the, the community come here with kids and get, get fed um, from the Bible. Uh, it's amazing to see some of the, the things that are, the puns that are used in the back of a trunk. It's not like we don't have enough puns here already, but this is, this is always fun. Um, I guess, Matthew, you have an announcement to make. Uh, so just a quick reminder, uh, Fall Retreat is coming up. Um, it's going to be October 30th to November 1st. Um, it's kind of the last reminder before the deadline, which is on this Wednesday, the 14th. Um, I need your name signed up on the sign-up sheet back there in the lobby, or we have one available uh, at the farmhouse. Um, I need your name signed. Um, I need money by then, it's about $90, and your uh, medical release forms. Thank you. Need those three things. By Wednesday, um, if you're interested, please come. Please sign up. It's going to be an awesome time. Uh, Sean Isaacs is teaching. He's fantastic if you haven't heard him before. Um, so I just wanted to get that reminder out to you guys, and thank you very much. It's so great to see the, the youth move in, in this church. Um, one more thing. Um, on the way out, on that little table right there underneath the offering box, if you could grab an outline of Ben's sermon, um, it's just a reminder of what you saw here and heard here, but also uh, it allows you to talk about something very interesting, uh, I guess from a nerdy perspective th this time, <laughs> um, and it, it always does help me. Um, please stand up and we'll have the worship team sing us out. Praise God, praise God. From whom all blessings flow, praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow, praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Whoa!
Thank you.